Welcome, everybody. It's a pleasure to have you for this uh, special edition uh, live stream playthrough. It's a sneak peek of sorts. It's actually, I've got to update my little three minute countdown because I think I've got designer interviews, uh, pre order news, new game announcements. I don't say anything, however, about a uh, live stream gameplay or a preview of a game. So, this is something completely different, something we're excited to do to give you some insights into some uh, new games under development at Compass Games. And if you like the idea, We'll work on the format, look to improve it, and yeah, we'd love to make this available to you all. So I want to welcome everybody on YouTube and Facebook. Thanks for joining us live today. One thing you'll notice also if you're on YouTube is uh, we uh, have an upgraded service. The actual service provider now provides uh, HD 1080i, so a better resolution if you're on YouTube. For Facebook, it is still 720 streaming, but uh, you know should be good enough quality for HD. It's good to see War Steve and Tom D on YouTube. So thanks for chiming in to say hello. And uh, again, it's going to be a really uh, simple format tonight. So again, uh, it was a pleasure to have uh, Christopher Davis on a little over a month ago. We did a uh, Compass Games Live episode 35 featuring Chris and talking about his Operation Storm 333. And we uh, it was his idea, which is a great idea, is let's do a live stream session showing you playtest components, the game actually in development, where Chris is going to actually walk you through a sample playing of the game, or at least a portion of the game, to give you a better idea of how the game flows. And Chris will talk about, uh, obviously, where it is with development. It's really a chance for you to ask clarifying questions or to probe uh, Chris. You know, as Chris shows, shows the game, I'm going to take your questions and feedback, and I'll try to display the, those uh, that communication to him so he knows uh, what's happening. So without uh, further ado, I want to invite Chris back in. So Chris, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you now. So there we go. I we'll have to be nice to you because we are going to have you talking the whole time. I don't get the t I don't have to talk this time so much. Yeah, I must feel like a relief. Well, thanks for having oh, me. Oh, <laughs> it's great to have you here again. And uh, just to let everybody know, Chris also uh, did a No Enemies Here interview with Dan Picaldi a few weeks ago. So if you do a YouTube search uh, for, uh, obviously, under Chris Davis or Christopher Davis, but you can also do it under No Enemies Here or Compass Games Live, you'll find some hits for some interviews with Chris. So, uh, it, again, the interview was great. Please check out episode 35 uh, about Operation Storm. Uh, 333. And that's what we're going to, I think that's what we're going to be focusing on tonight. We're going to actually go through, talk about the design, where it's at, and have you literally walk through a sample gameplay, show how the game is played, right? Yeah, absolutely. So I guess I'll take it from here. And yep, um, so Operation Storm, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, uh, is a solitaire design, and it's meant to depict the Soviet coup in Afghanistan. Uh, that kicked off the Soviet uh, invasion of the country uh, in December of 1979. And so there's really two parts to it, and I'll walk everyone through the uh, the module in both phases, and I will uh, play a little bit of the first phase of the game and then also give you a sample of the of the tactical piece of the missions and how the combat's supposed to play out. So um, without any further delay, I'll bring up the Vastral module. And just keep in mind, it's all, proto it's all prototype play testing stuff right now. So the art is, you know, the art is what it is. And um, yeah, we'll go from there. Right, yeah, go ahead go ahead and share your screen, yeah. Chris. Once I see it, I'm going to go ahead and I've got uh, the uh, Oz behind the curtain controls here to bring up your uh, screen. So I'm going to bring it up now. And uh, yeah, I'll let you, uh, I'll let you take it away from here, Chris. So thank you so much for doing this again. Somebody had posted, uh, um, not, hopefully no concern here. Uh, Tom said, on YouTube, he thought he had lost the stream, so maybe there's a hiccup. We'll see what happens. Maybe if somebody's on Facebook or YouTube right now, they can just uh, ping us with a message. But I do see there's people online right now, uh, so I can see that we do have a, quite a few people that have joined. So hopefully everything's okay. Uh, it's, oh, it's all good. Tom just gave the okay signal. So okay, let's go great. ahead and proceed, Chris. Go ahead and take yeah. it away. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, first I'll just walk everyone through what you're looking at here. So um, as I mentioned, it's played in uh, two phases. The first phase is the planning phase. And in that phase, uh, you, the player uses their key leaders to essentially plan the mission. Um, and what you're looking at here is the planning board on uh, how all of that will work. Um, so of course you have your, you know, your turn track, your turn marker, up here, this tells you how many turns you have left. Um, this marker, the OS333 marker, is when the operation is supposed to start. And there are events that can move this left or right. Uh, 
going further down, uh, operational support. So each uh, power ministry, so like the KGB, the Army, the GRU, um, has varying levels of support of the mission. And depending on that level of support is the number of units you can um, draw each turn, essentially, and assign. Um, and then the intelligence and alert levels of each target. Um, the intelligence will tell you uh, the type of units that are there. Um, so you can reveal uh, masked units before the mission starts. And the alert level is how many additional enemy units are added. Um, and so some of the stuff is still being worked out as far as like balance of how many units um, are drawn each turn or, or available on each map uh, through the play testing. But essentially that's how it works uh, conceptually. Uh, and here in the center, you can see the assembly area. So there's eight target missions um, and there's a tactical map up here associated with each one where you actually execute the missions. And I'll show you that next. Um, and so during this phase, what you're doing is you're assigning units and leaders, as you can see here, um, to each assembly area before the game proceeds to the next phase. Uh, and then here in the center, these are actually leaders that are physically in the country and they can do different actions uh, that affect the intelligence and alert levels or undertake special tasks that might uh, affect the mission before you uh, undertake them. Uh, and then there's several different kinds of cards. There's event cards that are pulled each turn, which you'll see shortly, operational cards, which are provide you some flexibility in, in gameplay, and then tactics cards, which are used during the actual combat. Um, and then the big piece, of course, are the key leaders. Uh, so they're leaders for um, every, there's leaders for every, um, service so you have kgb leaders gru leaders army leaders um, and then each leader has a uh, skill uh, so the skill here is a doctor this one's a general up here he is um, uh, spetsnaz uh, and they can do uh, different things uh there's of course uh for those of you familiar with vassal uh there's different tabs uh rolling die of course uh the card decks uh the key leader tables uh Afghan units, charts, of course, on how to actually play the game. So these are different key leader tasks that can be undertaken and so forth. Um, and we'll, you'll see some of these as we play through. And then there's the uh, sequence of play, of course. Uh, and the casualties box where all your losses and enemy losses will go and then all the mission maps. And the mission maps are all point to point maps. Again, this is all play testing stuff. But uh, this is the mission I'll be I'll be showing you uh, shortly, and so th that's essentially what the module looks like. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to play through like three to five turns of this to, uh, and walk through through different options and um, features, and then we'll switch over to the tactical mission. And, um, I, and I do want to yeah. yeah I, was go just, ahead. I was just going to add here. So just for everybody, so you now that you see. He, uh, Chris actually almost went through a components walkthrough of sorts. So if you think from a compass perspective, what we do is Chris gives us the overall footprint of the design as far as what's needed. So obviously you've got game counters, but there's going to be multiple displays, not just player aid cards, but there's operation maps. There's different maps, there's tactical, et cetera. So you can get an idea already that as we work with Chris on his design and understand the parameters of what he's going to need from a production standpoint, there's going to be several, I'd call them maps for lack of a better term. Um, you're you're going to see a lot of cards. There's going to be a deck of cards. Uh, what, what's the total number of cards right now, Chris? You think uh, uh, you know it's around a plus 100? I, I think, is yeah, it plus 100? I, I think I think so. Because there's three I different types. Different. Yeah, there's the yeah. events, operations, and tactics. So so just so you guys know, from a publisher standpoint, we obviously look at the footprint of the game, and the reason we do that is if it's like a single map game. Uh, that tells us we have a chance to actually we're going to do the printing overseas where it's going to be a mounted map, et cetera. In this case, I'm not sure exactly because it looks like the displays can all be small in size. So probably depends on the count. Maybe we could go mounted. Uh, possibly, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll cross that bridge when we get there. But uh, just I want to share just a little bit from the Compass perspective when we're looking at this. Uh, you know, we look at holistically what what's the overall component mix. And then Chris helps drive through development. You know, what's the best way? Uh, I think you showed some displays that were through the menu bar that actually could mm -hmm. probably be on the map itself. I think it was eliminated. I don't know if it, if it was eliminated units or there was something that yep. was. Yeah, there's a couple of these. There's yeah, a so there's things like that. So so things. Play. Yeah, so things like that will either be on cards or maybe they're integrated on the maps. You know, we'll we'll figure out where these things end up 
uh, for sure. So uh, I'll let it, I'll turn it back over to you and I'll be watching questions and comments for everybody on Facebook and YouTube. Yeah, uh, thanks, John. And also, I do want to give a shout out um, to one to John for for doing this and you know trying something new and uh, as far as like walkthrough. And then also uh, to Kevin uh, Conway, I saw his little Discord thing pop up here, but he was uh, he's been instrumental in helping me actually build some of these vascular modules. So I just wanted to give a shout out to him too. Um, all right, so without further ado, we'll uh, go forward and. As you saw in the sequence of play here, a turn consists of several different stages. Uh, the first one is always a random event. Um, and I love random events just because it adds a little bit of flavor and unpredictability to a game. So um, what you'll do here is you'll just draw a card and there's no modifying the random event or order or anything like that. You just draw the top one and whatever it says is uh, what you do. Uh, so this one's a bad one, unfortunately. So uh, the operational support of the KGB actually goes down a level. Uh, and what th that will mean is um, when it comes to the key leader actions, I'll actually be able to draw less um, less units um, during each uh, turn. What does that event reflect in real terms, you think? What's happening so, behind the scenes? How would you describe so real, that event? Yeah, so that one reflects, um, you know, skepticism for this kind of operation among senior officers who are responsible for planning it. Um, so it might be, you know, they're skeptical about the resourcing or the timing or something else uh, about it. And so there's a hesitation to, um, you know, commit fully to the planning process. Thanks. Thanks for the explanation. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of cards like that. There's also cards that will increase uh, the different support levels or affect intelligence or alert levels in different ways. Um, but the player also has the option using the key leaders, which you'll, you'll see here in a bit, uh, to change all that. So once that's complete, you know, just going down the sequence of play, you'll draw an operational card. So that number is determined by the level of support from the Pullet Bureau. Oh, hey, Chris, is, could you do me a favor? There's yep. a little dialogue at the bottom of your screen. You can hide it. Uh, oh, yeah. Just to give it. There you go. Perfect. Thank oh, you, sir. Shoot. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, here we go. Um, all right. And uh, so the the support level of the Politburo, which uh, for those of you unfamiliar with the Soviet um, system of government, Politburo was essentially the highest uh, decision-making body and in some ways effectively really the only decision-making body. Um, that determines the number of operational cards you get. And that's important because these cards are very flexible. They can bring new leaders on the board. They can affect almost any aspect of the game in this phase and in the next phase. Um, so you want to collect as many of those as you can get. Uh, with this level of support, and I believe that's in the chart here. Um, no, it's not. But at this level of support, you can draw. Basically, you select, you draw four cards and you select one. Some of them just have you draw a card. Like as it gets lower, you just draw a random card and that's what you get. Um, and then when it's at full, you can actually draw two cards uh, and select and select two cards. How's the play balance looking? War, War Steve on YouTube is asking a question about uh, play balance for some of the scenarios. Yeah, so that's one thing I need to, that's, that needs to be flushed out with more play testing because what I don't want to happen is um, missions being too difficult because you can't get enough troops, but also missions being too easy because you're flooding the board with it. Um, and that's really going to come down to us essentially a law of averages of play testing as much as possible. And, you know, it's as a one man show, it's hard to um, do as much play testing as I'd like. So I definitely invite anybody who uh, want to invite anybody who's interested in play testing. Yeah. You know, give it a shot if you want to try it once, 100 times. What, I, what I'm aiming for is the 100 play tests. So if it's one person doing 100 tests or 100 people doing one test, um, that's where that's kind of where I'm comfortable at. But we'll there, see. What, there we'll there you go. Chris's rule of yeah. 100. It's got a nice little yeah. ring to it. <laughs> yeah. And then so can you remind me, me, can you see the yeah. question? Because you only have a single screen. Do you see the question when I post it or you only see Vassal? Uh, I only see Vassal. Okay. So the question from uh, mm -hmm. uh, Steve was, can the Russians win? Was his question. Uh, yeah, would, so, uh, yeah. So what I am uh, looking to do, and this part isn't fully fleshed out yet. So each mission will have uh, different victory conditions and or objectives that you'll have to accomplish. And they'll have a conditional effect of whether or not you accomplish them on the other missions. 
So the sequence of missions are also important. And I didn't highlight that earlier, but right here is the op sequence. And so before you undertake the missions, you'll set all of these out. And that's the order you'll uh, conduct your missions. Um, and there's events that might force you to do a mission earlier than you anticipated. Um, and then after you complete all those missions, there's going to be there's going to be a debriefing manual, uh, very much inspired by um, uh, Enemy Coast Ahead's Doolittle Raid. Um, and there's going to be a victory point charts for kind of each section that tells you where you succeeded and where you fell short. So if you take too many key leader losses, uh, there might be, um, you know, the effects might be much more negative as far as like the KGB or the general staff is concerned. But if you manage to capture all of your objectives, the military effect might be uh, might be higher. So I'm still working working the contours of that piece out right now. Sounds good. Uh, all right. Okay. And as I said, so uh, with this one, you get to pick one card. Uh, so all the cards can be discarded. If there's a card you don't like, all the cards can be discarded to draw a new key leader at any time. Um, and you draw them uh, randomly, unless it tells you you can select one. Or you can just choose one of these. Um, and I'll just choose, uh, I'll just choose this. I uh, actually can't do that one. So there's some that are marked as special tasks and these are, these are uh, key events that ha actually happened um, in the mission, leading up to the mission that might have affected um, the outcome of the operation. So there might be a, a um, one of them is, as you can see here, an officer exchange dinner. Um, another one is um, an assassination attempt against the Afghan president. And there's conditions that, of, um, there's conditions that you have to meet to attempt these. Um, so I'm not going to pick that one. Um, and just for the sake of moving this along, I'll just pick this one here. The uh, dinner card was interesting because I know he was uh, his soup was poisoned. <laughs> so, yeah. Yep. So it's an interesting tie in because the I literally poisoned his soup for I guess dinner. So, so there's yeah. the dinner card, right? <laughs> yeah. And the, and the Soviet uh, doctors assigned to his medical team actually saved his life or at least yeah. or, or at least were part of that metal life saving process. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, it just shows you also the difficulty in planning something like this uh, when, you know, different arms of the government aren't coordinating with each other. Yeah. So I'm actually looking at this card, even though I picked it, um, I can't, uh, let's see, it's number six. Yeah, I can't actually use it. So I'm just going to discard it and draw a new uh, leader. And I'll draw just draw another KGB leader. And as you can see, there's a lot of features in the module to help facilitate play. Um, as the little movement marker, there's different options on here. And as I, as I mentioned earlier, thanks to, uh, Kevin for putting all this together for me. Um, so new leaders come out here, they go to the available leaders pool and you can do different things with them. So leaders already assigned to an assembly area. Um, you can use them to draw a new tactics card, um, which can be used during the mission. So I'll just draw a tactics card so you can just see what those are like. Um, and they allow you to do different things. And these will become more clear uh, once you see how the tactical piece plays out. So I'll draw a, a card with him. So he's activated, he's done for the turn. Uh, these other units, um, you could draw new units to the board or you can add tactical weapons to them. So a PKM, um, you know, a grenade launcher, things like that. Um, and that's all, that's all built into um, the, the system here. Some quick questions for you, Chris. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt you, but we've got some good no questions worries. coming in. A uh, uh, question from uh, over on Facebook, Eagle in the Sun. Were you able to interview any of the troops involved in this operation? No, uh, I have not. But there is a, and I will, I'll pull it up. At, make, remind me to pull it up after uh, we're done with the walkthrough. But there is a, uh, a act, after action review, I guess, written by uh, a, an American um, uh, scholar who's an expert on on Russian military stuff. He wrote about this entire operation, and a lot of my a lot of the gameplay decisions are based on his write up. Since there's not a lot of English language, um, you know, yeah. resources available about the operation. Great. And then uh, Kenneth T is asking over on uh, on YouTube, wasn't Taraki suffocated with a pillow? His question is, uh, you know, I don't recall off the top of my head, but. Um, 
at the time of the Soviet attack, Amin was uh, the president and um, a big thing the Soviets feared was that he was, um, uh, he mis so mismanaged the country that they feared he was actually a CIA plant um, <laughs> to destabilize Afghanistan. There you um, go. So, you know, there's a lot of paranoia going around and um, sure. on all sides there. Um, all righty. Yeah. I will let you continue. Thanks for the yeah. thanks for the questions again. And I'll I'll bring them in at various times. I'll probably space them out a little bit just to mm -hmm. give you a chance to get through the playthrough a little bit uh, quicker. Yeah. No, no problem. And uh, so each leader can do one action during this phase. So the leaders here in the middle, you can either reassign them to a different location where they can do different things, um, or you can have them try to increase the intel level or decrease the alert level. And this is all, and they're all done with um, one die. Um, all basically the same table. I know this table is called the advocate for support table, but it's all functions the same way. Um, so essentially this leader here um, at the Central Army Corps headquarters, I'm gonna attempt to decrease the alert or increase the intelligence level um, right here. And essentially he, there's no bonuses for his role. Uh, so you roll a one, uh, D6, and basically I have to get a, let's see, I'm going to sum, so I have to get a five or higher. Um, and he gets a one, and the one is always, a modified or unmodified one is always a failure, so there's always a decrease. So it, he really bungled his job there, um, which is gonna make you know collecting intelligence at that location harder. Um, so then Alexiev at uh, the palace is also going to do the same thing. And he rolls a five. And the palace is also at, yep, so the palace goes up too. So as I mentioned, what this will do is when the mission is actually executed, um, units are, enemy units are drawn on the board uh, face down, and then you can select a certain number based on the intel level to turn face up. So you know what you're facing uh, before the battle starts. Uh, and then these other leaders, you can assign them um, to here under the box, or you can have them try to increase the support levels. So generals, uh, as you can see, Drozdov's a KGB general. So he, he gets a, uh, a modifier to help increase the bullet bureau. Um, so I'll do that for him. Oops, don't want to delete him just yet. Um, and he gets a three, which uh, falls short of what he needs to do. Actually, with the four, no, yeah, still falls short because um, he needs to get uh, a six. And then, uh, so he's done. And then we could try, we'll assign Boronov to a assembly area. So in the next turn, he can start moving units. And then um, we'll send Peliev to Afghanistan. So, so leaders that you send to Afghanistan don't arrive uh, right away. They go through this uh, movement box essentially, which is then mobilizing and then getting sent to the country. So it takes a few turns for a leader to arrive in country. Uh, so that's, you know, that's one turn. And then when that's done, you move on to the next turn. And so I'll play through it uh, one more turn, one or two more turns, and then um, we'll go over to a mission. So how do you yeah. feel about your first turn, how it went? Uh, you obviously rolled a one, which wasn't good. It hurt you, actually. Mm -hmm. um, did you get everybody placed where you wanted? It looks like, yeah, the general has a benefit. Or yeah, the, yeah so, um, so generally speaking, you want to um, try to get as many key leaders in place early on as possible, because then that will open up as many, action, as many uh, more options for you uh, down the road. Because each, as I said, you can only do one action with a leader per turn. Um, and then using at least using a percentage of those to try to increase your uh, support level. And you can't you don't have enough leaders to do everything. Um, yeah. So and then there's also actions that might force you to take leaders off the board. Um, and you said the event card was actually hurt you. I think you said the event card you drew for turn one was uh, mm -hmm. non beneficial yeah. to your cause, yeah. right? To your mission. Yeah. Okay. All and right, there's, turn there's, two. Yeah. yeah. There's more event cards than there are turns. So every. Mm -hmm game there should be a uh, a different mix of uh event cards gotcha all righty so, on on the turn two all right so this one's a bad one too <laughs> oh great so, yeah so <laughs> every every target uh you lose a certain amount of intel um so this one is essentially 
reflecting the friction between the Soviet and Afghan governments and the uh, the Afghan armies decided to cancel their joint meetings. Mm. And so, um, you know, the, the Soviet officers on the ground aren't able to engage their counterparts and collect info on them uh, as, as much as they would like. So you just roll one die um, and divide that in half and that's how much intel you lose and that's a lot. So that's gonna be basically wipes out all the intel um, that was collected in the country so, up to that point. So we're in, so we're in a bad spot right now, but it's early on, and um, you know, just gotta just gotta keep moving forward. So yeah, um, no in, no intel sounds pretty bad actually. Yeah, it, that exactly. doesn't sound like it's just a minor <laughs> issue for your mission to have like zero. It's not even at low anymore. So <laughs> that yeah, cannot be a good thing. <laughs> yeah, because each mission will have a random set of. You'll see on the maps here. There was initially a. Um, uh, a setup for each mission for for units, enemy units, but I'm actually going to discard that and go more with the random placement. And so it's always going to be a question of what mix of units are going to be on the board because there's some standard units, there's some bodyguard right. elite units, um, and there's also civilians who don't have any, in, at least combat impact on the ground, but you get penalized if you um, harm them during the operations. At this um, early, at this early stage, are you going to be focused on getting the intel up starting turn two? Is that like a how high a priority is it for you seeing intel dropping to nothing? How's uh, that impact your future play at this point? Uh, it w it won't be the highest priority because I the biggest priority is really getting the operational support level up right okay. now because that will get you more cards and more units. So as you see, the general staff and the GRU uh, support levels are at none. Um, so I, I can't even draw, you know, assigned GRU units to the board yet. I'm still working on the max number of like hard count of units that you have available. So right now in Vassal, you can make a thousand, you know, markers if you want, but there's going to be a, obviously a hard count of limit of how many you can actually physically put on the board. And so the number of KGB units that you see here, um, there's not going to be enough to do every mission. Um, so you're going to have to get support from the GRU and also from the army um really the airborne forces uh, to get more units on the board and Alrighty. both of those are at none yeah so both of those are at none and so you can't yep. draw any of those right now and you see here these are the units that you can bring on the board for support level um and as you get more support you can bring on more units you can draw more cards yeah that's like critical that. obviously critical mm -hmm. that's the life's blood of your mission all righty yep. i'll take it away for turn two then yep yep so uh i'll clear all the uh action markers and then um, we'll go again. So drew the event. So, and then uh, all the key leaders that are on the four teams will advance the space uh, to get closer to deploying. And then, again, you just go through your key leaders um, on, on their actions. So draw stops, the only one available now. Uh, oh, excuse me, you draw a support card. And because I'm still here at some, you know, I can look at four cards and draw one. um so don't need any of these yet so either of these could be good because they get more units on the board uh, much quicker this one i can't do yet because i don't have the uh the support level for the KGB up yet but this one the conditions are apply so at least i could get more units on the board what do the cards say i can't read them quite uh is there like a title on the card or what yeah so you yeah, so each card has a title. This one's um, mil military staffing. Oh, there we go. And, okay, thanks. Yep. yep. And, um, so this is saying the general staff um, support level is, uh, actually, I can't do this one either. It's greater than low, not less than low. Um, so, but I can discard a card to bring one key leader on the board at any time. So I'll, I'll do that anyways. Um, and I'll bring a army leader on the board because there are army generals and they might be able to help uh, get that support level up. Uh, let's see who we have here. And so Rybachenko, he is a uh, Soviet airborne general. So we'll we'll use him for that. Uh, one thing I do want to say during this phase, there is a potential loss condition. So if at the end of the turn, the Politburo support level is at none, then the mission is canceled. and the game is over. Um, so it does give you an opportunity to to try to increase the support level if you uh, if it does go to none. 
because uh, there are events that might decrease it. Um, and then also field roles might decrease it. Um, so it might be important to have key leaders available here um, in case that happens. All right, so we'll try that again. Um, we'll roll for, uh, you know, Drozov gets a plus one and it's a one again. So uh, the bad luck continues. So the That's a fail, automatic failure. Yeah. Yep, Not automatic good. fail. Not yep. good. And so I'm gonna pass on using Robichenko for that because if I draw another one, I don't have any leaders left to attempt uh, to bring the pull up your support back up. So we'll try to use him on um, the GRU marker. And he gets a four. So that the GRU marker comes up. And what that means is now the key leaders on the board here can recruit GRU units um, and bring them on the board. And I'll, and I'll do that to show you the different kinds of units that are available. Um, so you saw there's a Spetsnaz unit um, that are KGB. So those are represent um, like the Alpha and Zenith uh, Special Forces teams. And then there are, um, for the VDV and for the GRU, there are um, fire groups and mobile groups, which have different uh, stats. So at this level of support, as you see on the chart, I can bring on one uh, or two GRU units. So I'll do that. I'll bring on a fire group and a mobile group. Um, and so it's not reflected in the module yet, but the fire group can have essentially all of the tactical weapons attached, whereas a mobile group can have a limited amount attached. I um, mean, you'll see at the bottom here, uh, the left is their action number. That's how many actions they can take during the tactics phase. And the right number is the number of, uh, is their combat value. And that's how many uh, die they will roll during combat. And then the green reflects they're in a, a low ready state, meaning um, more actions than combat. So they're, they're ready to move, but you can change into a high ready state, which during the combat, during the missions, uh, which changes the number of activations they do, but all, but increases their, their combat level. So that reflects the fact that, you know, they're moving slower, they're more prepared, they're expecting like immediate contact with the enemy, as opposed to trying to uh, move on the battlefield. Um, so those are some of the tactical, tactical decisions you have to make. Um, so we got two GRU uh, units here, um, going to the Army General Staff, and then Karpukin. Um, so instead of bringing a unit on the board, um, you can also, as I mentioned, bring uh, weapons. So we'll add some tactical weapons to our um, Spetsnaz team here. And because the it's a KGB unit and my support level for the KGB is some, I should be able to bring uh, two weapons onto the board. We'll bring an RPG. So each weapon system uh, also has its own benefits, which you'll see um, in the charts. And these are the different modifiers they'll have uh, during combat. All right, I think that is all oh, the leaders on the board here. So we'll have them try to increase intelligence levels uh, for their respective areas again and uh, see what happens. So basically, as in the just as I mentioned, all the charts are here. So you just go back to the charts. Um, he just needs a three or higher. So he's got a 50% chance and he doesn't get it. Um, and Alexiev has also a 50% chance. Um, and he doesn't, he gets a one again. So a lot of bad rolls uh, to start. So things aren't, aren't looking good <laughs> for the first two turns. Um, but you know, that could always change. There's also different leaders that have modified the results for you know each of these different roles. Um, so then you, uh, with that turn's done, you move on to the next turn. Or turn three. The, uh, yep, turn three. Turn three, yep. uh, quick, quick question. Matthew yep. Albring over on YouTube is asking, where's the pre-order page? <laughs> he likes what he's seeing. So, <laughs> so just to let, let you know, Matthew, I guess that's a Compass question. So uh, yeah, we're going to do the pre-order page, but we're not quite there yet. You know, we're mm -hmm. giving Chris time as a designer to, uh, again, he's looking for that rule of 100. Under play test, so he, there's quite a bit he wants to do. And of course, we could always put a game up for pre order that's still going through play testing, but we're just going to wait a little bit, um, you know, let him flush it out a little bit more. And then, uh, mm -hmm. you know, pre order page, I expect, I fully expect we'll have the pre order page up before end of the year for sure. Just to let, just to give you some uh, 
expectations there, Matthew. So thanks for your question. And now we're on to turn three. Stop yeah, the bad stop. die rolling. Stop the bad die rolling, yeah. please. Yeah. So I'll just I'll just play through one more turn real quick, and then I'll move on to the attack mission. Um, yeah. So you start with pulling the event. Uh, bad weather, Kabul. So uh, planes aren't flying into the airport. So my key leaders aren't going to advance. Um, the four teams um, do not advance this turn. Which again is another another negative. It will take with them one more day to or one more turn to get there. Um, with uh, operational support at um, low, instead of picking a card, I just draw a card, and that's the one I got to accept. Um, so this one's actually not bad. There is a leader at the palace, and I can use that to increase the intel or decrease the alert level um, at the palace. But right now, this early, I think I want more leaders on the board. So I'm going to discard that and bring another uh, leader on the board. And I'll bring a uh, GRU leader on the board. Um, and so he's a tactician. And so tacticians um, can draw two tactics cards instead of one for their actions. Um, so I'll do that um, right now before assigning him anywhere. Uh, and yes, there are uh, a limited amount of tanks and armored vehicles in the game, even though this was mostly a special operations mission. Uh, the palace itself was defended by um, a, uh, a tank unit. Um, and part of the operation was to neutralize the crews before they can get to their armored vehicles. Um, but that's no guarantee that will happen in the game. Uh, and also, some of the airborne forces used um, some armored fighting vehicles um, when they arrived at their target area. And so I'll draw another tactics card um, in satchel charges. Um, so some maps are marked with breach points, which are, as you saw on the maps, are point to point. So it allows alternate routes um, to different objective areas. And so you'll, you'll keep all your tactic cards in one pile until you move on to the next phase. And then you'll sign all the tactics cards to each mission. And so um, you know, if you only have one satchel charges card, there's multiple, some of these cards, there's multiple looks of them in the deck, but if you only have one card in your hand, um, you don't have to make a decision of where you want to use that. Um, and then again, we'll move, uh, we'll attempt to increase the bullet bureau support. And it does increase back up. And we'll attempt to increase the uh, uh, GRU support again. So it needs a going from low to some, it will need a four. And then just roll a four. Oops, excuse me, a D six, and he misses it by one. But because it's not a one, uh, it stays where it's at, fortunately. So all those leaders are done. Um, and then with the rest of the leaders, um, we can try again with Intel. And the intel does increase for the Central Army Headquarters, which is in here somewhere. Oh, there it was. And then the intel for the palace stays at a zero. Um, and then these last two uh, leaders, you can, so when you bring on new units, there's no restriction on where you can place the unit. So even though the key leader is assigned to this box, <clears throat> you can put the leaders in other boxes um, because the, when you actually execute the missions, um, I'll just duplicate. I'll just bring on two more GRU units. Um, when you actually execute the missions, you don't. Um, you don't necessarily need key leaders. The key leaders provide you uh, bonuses, but the units can operate um, without them. And so you can put uh, leaders or the new units uh, wherever you like. And if you don't have enough leaders to go around, um, you can do a mission without them. As long as you have one lead or one unit on each mission, you can attempt you can attempt that mission. Um, and then with the other leader, um, we could bring you know two more KGB units on the board. Um, and he won't actually, this one wouldn't have any weapons because you don't bring the weapons on with them. There's something you have to add separately. And so you can distribute them like that. And so you'll continue this process. You know, this is the first three turns. You'll continue this process until you get to this marker here. 
there is an event and I'll, you see all the different event names here. There's a lot of different events that can happen. Um, and some of these events might also move, um, you know, this uh, marker in a variable direction. So it can move up to three spaces in either direction, um, depending on, on the die roll for that event call. And, and just to, re to yeah. recap, this is all the planning exercises. This is all what's going on behind the mission to prepare to launch the mission. This is the planning. Yep. yep. So and, then, so, and, then, and then at the end of it, if this isn't already decided here, you decide the order of the, uh, the missions you want to do. Because as I said, each one will have a condition, uh, um, a completion condition. So if it's completed, it will have a positive effect on the subsequent missions. But if it's not completed, it'll have a negative effect. Um, so that's something you got to balance out. And I'm still working out what those uh, effects are going to be. Uh, uh, so that'll, that'll come through with more playtesting to see what what's balanced. So well, that was a nice glimpse into the planning. A lot of things happened with bad event cards, some bad roles. Mm -hmm. You were handicapped a bit, but uh, now it's interesting the decisions being made. I just want to give you a quick time check. We've got a little under 20 minutes left. I want to make okay. sure I give yeah, you a heads up so you have a plenty of time to get to the next thing you'd like to show everybody. Yep. So we'll move on to the, uh, the uh, mission uh, map here. So as you saw, there's multiple missions that you can conduct. They're all point to point um, maps. Um, so each map will have a turn track. This part down here is going to go away because I, I reworked the initiative system, which I'll get to in a minute. And then um, they'll have assembly areas and that they'll have one or more assembly areas. And that's where you can start your units. I've already have them pre-placed here for today's purposes. And then there's different uh, terrain types, which are still being worked out, but essentially it comes down to interior and exterior spaces. And that's going to affect some of the uh, the uh, combat variables, which you'll see uh, see over here. Um, so, you know, attacking a unit that's indoors while you're outdoors, uh, et cetera, will have different things. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Additionally, uh, as you see, all the Afghan units start face down, so you don't know where they're at. I'm still working out um, placement, like the procedure on how they get placed and where they get placed on the map, but there'll be a variable number of units um, and they don't get revealed until they're activated or you're adjacent to them. And, um, and, it's, and then there's also a chart for their activation and you just go through these steps on, on what the Afghan units do. <coughs> Initially, I had a chip pull system, which I really like chip systems but I wanted to really streamline um, the solitaire focus administration of the Afghan stuff. Um, so now it's a push your luck system. So after every activation, you'll roll a uh, die, a 1D or 10. And if it's greater than the number of activations you have, um, or excuse me, if it's lower than the number of activations you have um, up to that point, then the Afghan units will go. So you get a, essentially you get a free first activation and then any time after that there's a chance that the afghans um, will activate um, because all these leaders start in the same spot um, a key leader in a space allows you to activate everyone in that space as opposed to each unit individually so we'll just move everyone um, as i mentioned everyone has a move active uh, action marker so you see some of these guys can move two some can move three so we'll just move them two spaces uh, one two oh, should probably take the uh, units with him that he's leading and then these guys will move into this building one two and then this unit will move um, up to this building two spaces is, is the main is the main objective here to clear the area of enemy to secure the area is this around uh, securing the, the perimeter or uh, uh, not taking as many losses or what's, what's the, um, I don't want to go too deep into victory conditions or everything, but yeah, so uh, a lot of that's what's the overall a lot objective. That's, yeah. A lot of that's still being worked out. As you see here, there's a minister um, counter. So most of the maps will have on the map that you have to kill or capture. Um, okay. And then there'll also be um, some of the maps will have a star in the space here. And that would be like an objective area that needs to be occupied at some point. Um, okay. And then there might be more conditional stuff. I'm still working that piece out. What I wanted to really focus on is just getting the combat system right. Yep, sure. Um, 
because I want I want a system that kind of flows really smoothly and rapidly to give you a sense of like a a fast you know operation um, that's happening in a matter of you know you know each turn is really a matter of minutes or seconds as opposed to you know days or weeks. Well, this is a good uh, point about your design approach. So, for as a design approach, you only have a you can only have your focus in a few areas at a time. Right now, mm-hmm. your focus is on the combat system you know, tooling it, testing it. You're not looking at the victory conditions yet necessarily or how units get placed. So you are having to sort of make priority decisions. What do I want to get worked out first to a degree that I feel comfortable moving on to some other aspect of the game mechanics? Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you might revisit combat after something happens. Or, you know, there could be, but it's interesting. Uh, I think this conversation is interesting because it shows you've sort of said, well, my focus right now is working out the combat system. There's other things that will come later, but right now it's about the combat mechanics, basically, right? Yep. All right. Sounds Uh, good. And yeah, and one thing that will also come later is the map layout as the play tests occur. You know, I drew drew these maps um, really um, arbitrarily. There's a sure. there's only a couple of them that are based on the actual historical locations that I could actually find legitimate mm-hmm. reliable maps of a building mm-hmm. layout. So a lot of these are really um, are going to be designed just for you know for game purposes, right? To make sure that yeah. it's actually enjoyable and fair uh, uh, yeah. and something useful um, and adds to the game. So well, uh, as I mentioned, um, re- the key leaders, uh, or excuse me the uh, push your luck system. So that was the first turn, essentially a free one. So there's the second action now, uh, or second activation. Because all those units were in the same space, they all activated together, but now they're separate. So I can only activate one of these before I have to uh, do the initiative roll for the Afghans. Um, So I'll start with Vostrotten's stack. So as I mentioned, key leaders can activate everyone in their stack as one activation. and so we don't know what Afghan unit is here. Um, so there is a, and you'll see here on the chart, uh, an action called observation. And basically that allows you to detect an Afghan unit or unmask an Afghan unit before you start shooting at it or it shoots at you. Um, because you can get penalized for uh, arbitrarily killing civilians um, during the heat of battle. Um, or you also don't want to walk into a trap if it's a stronger unit than you expected. So um, this fire group here will spend one of its actions to do an observation. Basically, you roll a 10, uh, one D10, and then um, you apply these modifiers. The target's in the indoor space, so it's a minus three. So basically, they're up close and personal, so there's a good chance you're going to know, be able to ID what the unit is. Um, so it's, I roll a one, and it's lower than this unit's combat value, so we get to see what it is. And it's an Afghan squad, so they have the similar values, activation values and combat values, and that's still being worked out too as I, as I streamline the Afghan activations. Um, and then um, the fire group, that was their first action, so now they can do a second action because they have a two, um, two limit here, um, and they're going to actually shoot at them. Uh, they have a combat value of three, and they have a PKM, so as uh, which is a light machine gun. And with the PKM, it's a minus two to their die to one of their die. And so, I'm just, you, when you have the physical die, you'll pick which die it will be. Maybe we can also have like a special colored die or something for for that. I don't know yet, but for the purposes of the module, it will just be the first die uh, as we go left to right on the results. So I'll pull up the um, multiple D10. Thing here, if I can find it behind one of these screens. Oh, here it is. Um, so he rolls three because he's got a comment value of three. Um, and it's a six, seven, and seven. So one of them's a five. Um, and then what you'll do is you go to the combat chart here and it walks you through exactly how the combat system works. So you roll the number of D, you'll roll the number of die, then you apply these modifiers. So it's a uh, minus two uh to the first die so it's really a four seven seven but then it's uh um plus two to each dice because of their combat value the defender's combat value and then you just roll through these uh modifiers here so they're i don't think any of these others apply yet nope um so really i rolled a um 
it's back to a six, seven, seven. And it's gotta be less than the attacker's combat value to score a hit or a one, which again, ones are bad in my design here. Um, but one can have result in immediate uh, kill in action for any unit. Um, but all of these are higher than a three. So there's no, there's no um, hits on the target, but one of the numbers is an even number. So it's the target is suppressed. Um, as you see here, it's a greater than or equal to the com attacker's combat value. Um, and so that's gonna affect the, um, oops, wrong button here. That's gonna affect the Afghan unit's activation and movement and also their combat. So the fire group with the PKM didn't do anything, but the mobile group can also shoot and they can, you, so you could do multiple actions such as movement, each space counts as one, but you can only do combat once per unit. So they will uh, roll for combat also. Actually, before doing that, they'll switch their um, ready condition. So they'll have a higher ready condition. Uh, is, uh, is it sequential when you have those multiple units there or do you have to declare up front what they're all gonna do before the first combat's resolved? Uh, it's sequential. So you resolve all the actions for one unit before moving on to the okay. next. Okay, got you. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So he's got a three. So they'll roll a three also, but they don't have any special weapons or anything like that. So they'll roll three die here. It's a four, six, six. So this will go um, because it's one space away. Combat can also take place in the same space. So units can occupy the same space for close quarters combat, which you see here as a modifier as well. So I'm taking the penalty for being for not being in the same space as them. Um, so it's really a five five seven, which again is not a hit. Um, it do doesn't even add to the suppression of the target. So my guys are shooting at them. Uh, they put their heads, force their heads down, but nothing um, nothing critical has. Is distant. there any impact of multiple uh, suppression results on a unit if they have multiple? Yeah. So they same and it's same with the hit. So it's all cumulative. So um, you see down here, all the combat results are cumulative. Um, and then also same with, uh, so some games, you know, if a unit gets a light wound twice in a row, then you add a severe wound instead. And if they get a second severe wound, then they're killed in action. Um, in this, it's not it's not that way. You can get as, an, a, a, um, the number of wound, wound levels and morale levels you get doesn't affect the severity or receiving a more severe one. Okay. Um, you have to check for those separately. Okay. Um, so you so you could potentially get a severe wound and a light wound on a target, and they each have different um, um, effects, as you can see here. Okay, got you. So as you see here, for example, an attacking unit that's severely wounded, it's a plus one to their combat for each wound right. they have. Okay. And then we um, just have markers. We'll have markers in the board game version, uh, mm -hmm. non-vassal version for tracking the, all that. Yeah. So there are yeah. So there's markers on here that are built yep, onto sure. the uh, unit. So you can see if a light wound, um, you can add a severe wound and so forth. Um, but yeah, uh, so, you know, you could in theory, you could in theory have a unit that is, has three severe wounds, but is still, um, still fighting. Um, they'll be really limited in their combat capabilities, but at least they're, they're still active. And that's to reflect that historically a significant amount of the Soviet operators were actually wounded or severely wounded um, during the operation, um, but they kept, but they were still successful nonetheless. So then after this, you would roll a one d ten if it's a. Um, so it's I've had two activations. If it's a one, and I've rolled a lot of ones. Um, if it's a one, then um, the Afghans go, and it's a one. So then the Afghans, <laughs> the Afghans will go instead of activating another unit. Um, and then you just go to the chart here um, to activate, to just go through this order, right? Your die rolling just sucks tonight. Let me tell <laughs> it you. does. You're just like hurting yourself in every possible way tonight. You're just but not... it, is, but it's showing different parts of the game, which is which is good. So um, yeah, so I'll just run through this part real the Afghan activation real quick, and then I'll I'll call it a day. And Sounds good. Yeah, that'll questions. be perfect. Perfect timing. Sounds good. Go for yeah. it. Um, so the first thing you'll do, all the Afghan units that are adjacent to a Soviet, Soviet unit, you'll reveal them. Um, so there's civilians there and more civilians in this building. So that's not a threat. Um, and then any combat units that are now revealed will start moving um, if they can. But there's nothing that meets that condition. Um, and then they'll conduct combat. 
Um, so direct fires, basically, they're shooting from one space to another. I'm still working on line of sight rules because, as you can see, there's interior and exterior spaces and rooms and things like that. Um, so you won't be able to shoot at every target that you can that's revealed on the board. So the Afghan combat works the same way. So they got two um, combat value of two. They roll two die, and they need a two or less. And um, still working out like on how they're targeting too. But essentially, would there's only one space within the target, so they'll roll two die for that. And they do roll a one, which means at least one of those units um, are going to be severely wounded or killed. Um, so on a one, you, you'll roll a, a second time, and then depending on what you get is the, the, uh, the consequence, right? So it's a seven, so one of these units will be severely wounded. Right now, it's really just player choice, and I might keep it that way, but we'll see. Um, so he's severely wounded. So the Afghans, um, they got a good shot back. And then the seven uh, doesn't apply because it's not a hit, and it's also the targets aren't suppressed. Um, and then really, that's it. Uh, there's no other Afghan uh, activations right now. And so you would go back to activating the Soviet units starting you know with the first activation and then a second a third a fourth until the afghans go again so uh, are there any further questions well what i've just done here is i'm going to show this and i know you can't see it right now chris so uh chris has recently posted you'll see it on social media sites he's inviting anybody that's interested in operation storm 333 there's uh again his uh, rule of 100 is in play right now. So he's looking for 100 playtest sessions. So he is looking for active playtesters or anybody that's interested in learning more about the game, joining in discussions about the game. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Discord. We actually have a Discord channel for Consum World. Chris ha has a Discord channel. I believe what's the title? The Jacobite. Uh, can you remind me of the title of your Discord? Um, uh, Jacob and Wargamer. Yes, yes. So what I've done is... I've posted the link for everybody. I know you can't see it right now, Chris, but in the stream, mm -hmm. anybody who'd like to join Chris's group on over on Discord, which is a great little chat application, also has like sound, it has video sharing, sound channels, et cetera. Uh, there you go, Chris, you can see it now. So you can just join, you can copy. What I'll do is in the YouTube, we'll have the high def 1080 recording. I will add a link for those interested in joining will be in the description, in the YouTube description. So everybody will be able to just click on it since I know it's a lot easier than trying to type out. So tomorrow we'll broadcast the uh, this recording and everybody will be able to just click on that link. And that will actually take, take you right directly uh, to Chris's Discord channel where he's got play test sessions going on for Operation Storm 333 and other discussions. And of course, other games you're working on as yeah, well. Of course. And then feel free, uh, anyone who joins that server, to reach out to me anytime. If you've got any questions, comments, suggestions, um, you know, I'm available for discussions at any time. So to recap, um, so I think this was insightful. I mean, we got to learn a little bit about the system. Uh, we got to see the planning phase and going into a mission. And there's multiple missions, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. as you've shown, in the, which sounds very interesting. So it goes very deep. We can see we just got a very small, we got a small tidbit of an example yeah. today. But for me personally, besides seeing the system, uh, what I pay attention to, it's interesting to hear your comments about here's what I'm still working on, or I, I like chip pull, yeah. or I like this, or something's based on this other system. I think you mentioned there was that GMT game you mentioned about the mm -hmm. debriefing, the debriefing um, yep. I think, after the mission. So, so it's really, for me, what I think, and I hope others probably would agree, that it, it's really nice to sort of get into your mindset of where you are in the design phase, what you're focused on, what you're sort of tabling to the side for now, perhaps to come mm -hmm. to later. But uh, so can you recap for us? So based on the mechanics, everything we've covered, uh, can you do your best job putting on the spot, sort of recapping where your focus is right now on the design, the things you're tinkering yeah. with, testing out? Yes, uh, so the planning phase is 95% done. I just have to work out the balance of transitioning from the planning to the execution phase. Um, the combat system is where I'm focused right now to make sure that one, uh, fun and then two, um, you know, uh, manageable, feasible as a solitaire system. And then the third piece after that will be you know, cleaning up some of the maps to, you know, balance out the maps and also the victory conditions um, for each mission and also for the game as a whole. And then, you know, so I feel like I'm starting to get to the final stretch here. Yep. Um, so most of the core mechanics and systems are in place. 
it's just a matter of you know stress testing them to see uh, you know see what what's broken. Yep, and then uh, obviously you can see the game artist will have a, a big role in this uh, in your game mm -hmm. because they're going to need to collaborate with you on the ergonomics of the map, what goes on yep. the map, you know, the card design. And, you know, there's a lot of the typical design factors that go into this. And you've got, again, you've got multiple things going on. So I think, uh, you know, we're going to want to obviously have a really capable artist, uh, you know, working on every component. And that's going to be a big effort when we get there. You know, that comes yep. much later. But the, in, in the meantime, we'll have the pre-order page. We'll have an effort around getting the uh, page description ready for the pre-order page, listing all the components, et cetera, we expect. And for Compass, you know, games, we can always alter the components later. If something changes, mm -hmm. latter phases of playtesting development. I just had uh, today for uh, Gregory Smith's got a big game. Um, uh, and I forget the title now, <laughs> but, uh, but it's a World War I uh, air game solitaire. And mm -hmm. we're adding a bunch of displays uh, just based on some late playtesting. We decided mm -hmm. we want to add more ergonomics, more helpful aids for players. So we can always adjust as we go. But again, just to remind everybody, so this will be available as a high def recording, available on YouTube tomorrow, uh, Thursday the 6th. And also I just wanna remind everybody that tomorrow evening, same time, 8 p.m. Eastern, we'll have our uh, fifth episode of uh, our Compass Games Town Hall meeting, and we will be giving away uh, free stuff, at least one free game as we do every town hall. So if you can join live tomorrow, you'll have a chance to win a free product from compass games which is always exciting to do so chris i want to thank you again uh, uh, great job again this is a great introduction uh, since the first uh, interview we did we really covered other things mm -hmm. but this really went deeper for the first time into your design and where you're at with the development so uh as andy says here it looks cool keep it up thanks thanks andy so uh, also thanks. i'm looking for i'm looking for feedback from everybody so uh, obviously, obviously you can see, you know, play test components, uh, which were quite good in Chris's case. Um, you know, they're going to be of varying types and uh, sometimes they might be hard to see because they're small, et cetera. But uh, I'll be looking for feedback and I know we'll get it over time. We'll try to do several of these in the future uh, with designers. But uh, yeah, if this is something you guys find helpful and interesting for titles you're interested in, sounds like this was a, a success for our first trial balloon. First trial run, this, this went very well. So again, thanks, Andy, uh, for the thumbs up on that. And uh, Chris, with that, I want to thank you again for your time tonight. And I will give you the last word before we go to send off time. Well, thanks, everyone, for uh, participating in your questions. And uh, thanks, John, also for hosting. I look forward to, uh, to making this game available and putting it on people's tables and seeing what you guys think of it. All righty. Well, thank you again, Chris. I know we'll we'll see you again with all the various things you're working on, but this was a great uh, trial run. Thanks for having the idea and the initiative to offer up doing a bit of a, a initial dive session in your game. Operation Storm 333, folks. Look for the pre-order coming later this year from Compass Games. Again, thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight, everybody. Bye-bye.